All right. So uh, last year, William presented our basically initial start on BlueOS. Uh, we've made quite a few changes from then, uh, but there's also some awesome features that were there from the start that we'll just cover briefly here as well, just to make sure that if you haven't seen that, uh, haven't come across BlueOS before, you get a sense of what's in it. Um, but the focus of this presentation is on what's new uh, and sort of what we've made available now. Um, so just as a quick overview, we'll be going through why we made BlueOS in the first place and how we've been going about the development. Uh, then William will talk through uh, how BlueOS integrates with the autopilot. Uh, then I'll cover some additional functionalities in BlueOS that are kind of outside the realm of the autopilot, but still useful for the vehicle and for the operator. And then William will go through how BlueOS can be extended by users and developers and the like. So just starting out, um, Blue, uh, Blue Robotics is a marine robotics company uh, where, well, William's the primary maintainer of RG Sub, uh, and the sub vehicles that we use rely heavily on onboard and companion computers uh, for video streaming, uh, flashing the autopilot. We have enclosures with the autopilot in it that aren't always great to open, especially if they're, you know, a thousand meters under the water. Um, <laughs> Then uh, Mavlink pass through down to the vehicle, um, including for joystick inputs. We often use a tether, uh, telemetry data going in both directions, uh, parameter setting, things like that. Uh, and then also fetching logs from the autopilot. As mentioned, if your autopilot is in an enclosure that you don't want to open, then you have to kind of get those logs out somehow. Um, we also use a lot of different third-party sensors. They're not all RG Pilot specific. Uh, some of them are quite high bandwidth and aren't particularly relevant to vehicle control. So it's not super important for the autopilot to know about them or to operate with them. Uh, and that includes like environmental sensors, like conductivity, turbidity. If you just want to have some scientific measurements that you're like, well, autopilot doesn't care about this, but we want the data. Uh, so our initial solution when Blue Robotics started and tried to make a vehicle uh, was basically just a forked and very highly modified uh, version of the RG Pilot companion software. Um, that's quite monolithic. Uh, it's, it's sort of one thing that's tied together. Um, and because of the, into, like the ex extensions and things that we wanted to make to that, it was difficult to maintain, especially because different people wanted to work on different things. And the like needing to fork the whole thing to run it on one vehicle made it hard to sort of share across vehicles while having changes from multiple people at the same time. Um, we also have just in general people who want to integrate different sensors, different actuators and the like, uh, and they sort of need an e ecosystem to like for them to thrive, they need an ecosystem where they can kind of easily develop their own components. Uh, and that has to be in a maintainable way and a way that can be shareable across vehicles without having to sort of fork the entire thing that everyone is running. So our target market for BlueOS is just anyone who wants to make or use an advanced robotic system. Uh, that includes developers, which is, you know, all of you plus very many people, um, users of our vehicles and any other vehicle that uses BlueOS, uh, it is open source and it's not intended for just marine robotics. So user, user base can be quite broad. Integrators of sensors, actuators, cloud services, whatever, um, and educators about uh, advanced robotic systems as well. Uh, the sort of underlying premise of a BlueOS system, uh, we're assuming that there is some kind of Linux-based onboard or companion computer available. Uh, there's network connectivity. BlueOS uses a lot of web-based things. Um, so ideally, network connectivity is always available. But if it's at least available during configuration, then you can still use our sort of configuration tools and the like. Uh, and then a Mavlink compatible flight controller. We generally recommend RG Pilot firmware because it's what we work most with. And so it has the best integration, um, which also works well at this conference. <laughs> Um, so just as a quick overview of an example system, uh, so you'd have a flight controller board, that's a navigator that we make, or you could have a Pixhawk, whatever you want. Um, BlueOS will just talk Mavlink to it, but flight controllers like a Pixhawk, we can flash the firmware onto, which is a kind of nice bonus. Uh, and that will have connection to the actuators and sensors that are relevant to the vehicle control. 
then you'll have your onboard or companion computer. Um, in our case, that's generally a Raspberry Pi, but BlueOS is made to be able to shift over to other systems as relevant. And you might have some environmental sensors or maybe some cameras and things like that that are attached or plugged into the that computer. And then there's some form of network link, potentially additionally Mavlink, but um, yeah, so Mavlink might go separately or just through the same network, network link. Um, and then William. So uh, after kind of trying to leave behind uh, that monolithic system that was our old companion, we had to do some design choices. We ended up choosing to have uh, container containerized components with multiple individual services as tiny as possible, basically microservices. <laughs> And uh, we also allow integrators to create their own extensions, which are basically individual containers that run alongside our car container that is actually BlueOS. So it's very easy to extend things. And we have uh, proper APIs and an interface to integrate everything nicely. One of the advantages of using uh, containers is that the dependencies are always isolated. So we can easily port this over to a new board or anything. And uh, we can also limit hardware and like resource access by extension. So we can have like processing limits. Say so you can only use one car of one CPU and 256 megabytes of RAM. That kind of thing is particularly relevant if you have. So in our case, the Navigator flight controller is a hat that sits on top of the Raspberry Pi. Um, so the uh, autopilot firmware is actually running on the Raspberry Pi, and you need to make sure that you have enough processing available that you don't like randomly lose control of your vehicle because something yeah. else took too many resources. Yes, the extensions need to be tightly controlled so things don't go out of hand. Uh, we choose to work with web interfaces and APIs. So we have we have lots of services, and all of these services they have uh, Swagger APIs, so it, they are very easy to work with for developers to integrate new things. Uh, we're planning to have a main dashboard where we can show lots of information together, have like an overview of the system, but it's not quite done yet. And we're also, we also have planned to have a pub sub architecture. I guess it's similar to what Ross has, but it's not quite the same solution. It's still on the works. Uh, our plan is to have synchronized login of arbitrary, arbitrary data, data types. And with our extension manager, it's easy to uh, install and uh, share extensions. I guess that's it. Next. Yeah. For the front end, we picked uh, Vue.js. It's a yes, recently new JavaScript framework that allows for very react reactive components. Uh, one example is we have a, we can animate a heart icon with the heartbeat, which is very nice to see when the vehicle is okay. Uh, it's very easy to, it's easy to reuse components. And we use Mavlink to Rust in the backend as a backend to actually talk to the vehicle, which is, it's written in Rust, so it's very efficient. Uh, it was designed with modern technology, so we are, it, we're based on Python 3.9 and with some people pushing for 3.11. Uh, all the critical services and the ones who, which need performance, they are written in Rust. And we use Mavlink Router for Mavlink Routing, but we also support, support Mavproxy, but Mavproxy is a GCS, not Router, so performance is not great. Um, all right, so system components, just as a quick overview um you've got your linux computer uh there's a blue os bootstrap uh docker container that sort of starts everything up and also monitors the core container so if something goes wrong then it can start things back up um and make it so that your system at least restores itself um the core container can uh, includes our core services um, so there's a variety of services there that we'll talk about in the in the later slides. Um, but one of those services is the extensions manager, and that's in charge of starting up and managing the extension containers. Um, so, for example, if you created a like self-contained device integration container, 
the extension manager is in charge of starting that up and making sure that it doesn't um, go AWOL. Uh, that then leads into the front end, uh, which is sort of web browser based, uh, which makes it device agnostic. So if you've got a mobile device, you can view the um, interface. If you've got a computer, you can view the interface. You just have to end up connected to the network somehow. Um, that interface has a sidebar that shows all of your um, pages and services that are available. And that includes if you've got an extension that you've created, uh, they can kind of hook into that and end up as part of the sidebar shown there. Um, the heartbeat icon that William's mentioning just before is shown up there. So you can kind of see it flashing and that is actually tied to the heartbeats from the vehicle. Uh, and in general, there's other just convenience features there like configuring your um, networking controls. You get warning icons if your um, system is overheating or things like that. Um, there's you can reboot the vehicle uh, and there's also a sort of regular versus pirate mode view option. So you can see there's quite a few different uh, services in the sidebar there. All of the ones with little pirate icons are kind of hidden by default. So a standard user who doesn't need to do any development or isn't trying to do anything crazy can just sort of work with their vehicle in an intuitive manner. And someone who needs a bit more power can just turn on pirate mode, gets a bit more access with the knowledge that they're in accessing more powerful features that could do damage to the system if used improperly. All right. OK, so what we have for uh, autopilot integration, we have we're able to show uh, all the firmware information, so which version, which uh, frame, which actually firmware, so rover, copter, sub. We can start, restart, select autopilot. We can actually, BlueS actually supports running multiple boards at the same time, which is, could be not very useful at a first, first glance. And we can also run zero on board. I guess it's similar to hardware to the like zero in hardware, but it's actually running on the Linux board. Uh, we can we can we can flash firmware. We have a nice interface for downloading everything. We can log, browse logs. We can see Mavlink data. We can manage Mavlink routing, and we can do peripheral setup. So this is the interface for uh, actual actual flashing and switching boards where you can say, hey, I don't want to run the navigator now. I can. I, I just want to use zero so I can test something. Another cool feature we have is that we can actually map our pilot's uh, serial ports to USB serial converters. So we can, with it, we can use, let's say, a USB GPS and connect it straight to our pilot running in the pipe. Uh, we have a in-browser parameter editor, and it supports most of the metadata, like uh, step, bit mask, options, range. It also has some fuzzy search, which is helpful. So this is a, it, this is us editing a bit mask. We have the, we have log viewer embedded into the flight controller. So even with no internet, you can still analyze logs. You don't have, you don't get like map tiles, but you can still analyze everything and see all the, see all the plots. OK. And we are working on downloading files via MavFTP for when we have, uh, let's say, a PixHawk or a Q-Belt pilot. For Linux, browsing logs is insanely easy as they are in the file system, so they are always easily available. For Mavlink, we have uh, a nice tool for Mavlink routing, which we actually use it uh, at the boat, like the lake test, to forward Mavlink to Randy's copter, which was pretty trivial and a nice demonstration. Uh, we have a Mavlink inspector, which can right now show all the messages and all the data, but we are working on actually enabling real-time plotting of data, as you have in MavProxy. Uh, this is the vehicle setup view. It has a, a 3D model that's easily, yeah, it's easily overridable by either users or, let's say, our distributors or anyone who wants to work with it. Uh, we have a lot of data there. We have the vehicle frame, firmware version. We have all the sensors detected via dev ID parameters. 
we, we detect our ping devices, which are sonars. In this case, we have both, both a rangefinder and a scanning sonar detected. Uh, the goal here is to continue working on vehicle setup and get everything, get all of the setup necessary in within OS. So we have like motor test and we have sensor calibration and, and other tools. You've probably seen this guy already. There's one down there. <laughs> um, yeah, we're releasing a boat soon. Uh, some of you may have seen it. This is just a quick display that like, yeah, you can switch out the 3D model um, and that is kind of detected based on the firmware that you've got available. So yeah, it's, it's detected based on firmware and frame. So we actually have frames for all kinds of ROVs and a boat. And, and I want to get frames for quadcopters and the other copters, but there, there are a lot of them. So work in progress. <laughs> Okay, so for vehicle setup, right now we have only motor test and output assignment, basically. Uh, it's It may sound trivial, but it's important for ROV users because they half of the support questions are people who, hey, my ROV is going the wrong way. So they, they have the motors wrongly assigned it. And this is also easily overridable. We just have to create the model right and we have instructions for that. All right, so some of the additional functionalities, um, there's, as uh, William mentioned earlier, the services that we're using uh, generally have REST APIs. Um, we also allow updating the version of BlueOS itself, and we've got quite a robust system for doing that. Uh, video streams, uh, generally the autopilot doesn't need to know about those, but we still want to see the video. Uh, while we're operating, especially because that's one of the main ways that you can control a submarine vehicle that's, you know, not visible because uh, it's in the water down deep somewhere. Um, we also have USB serial routing, uh, injection of NMEA, um, a file browser that allows you to access the files on, in the Linux file system, uh, a browser-based terminal, testing of the network uh, between your sort of control station and the vehicle, uh, information about the system on the vehicle, and then some more uh, information about the extensions. So the REST APIs, as William mentioned, uh, have swagger UIs that uh, improve, well, like make it easier to interact with them. Uh, so you can actually send API calls just from our um, helper service to just like test them out if you want to. And that's the same for if you as an extension developer, create an extension that provides an API that will appear in the same place and can be tested in the same way. Um, the service probes all of the open TCP ports, any of them that respond to a HTTP, HTTP probe are uh, detected and then are listed in the available service list. And services can also like register themselves by providing a register service endpoint with particular metadata in it, and that then allows them to hook into the um, sidebar and provide a, a web interface page. Uh, there are also some more internal developer-based services that don't, like, aren't really user-oriented, so they don't have um, external interfaces, but developers can use them. So there's the commander service that allows running arbitrary bash commands in the core Docker container. Um, and that provides access to the Linux system underneath using an HTTP uh, API. And there's also the beacon service, which allows configuring MDNS uh, network advertisements. So uh, we generally connect to the vehicle using blueOS.local um, as a sort of broad option. But if you're using a Wi-Fi connection, you can use blueOS Wi-Fi.local if you're just on the same Wi-Fi network as the vehicle. Um, and you can also set up custom ones for um, different extensions and the like. Uh, the version chooser, there's a bit of a GIF here of <laughs> Um, a version being installed, but basically the default interface is just if there is a more recent, similarly stable version of BlueOS available, it will come up as a button that you can click install and update. But if you're in pirate mode, you have the access um, to see all of the versions that you've installed previously that are still on your system and you can switch between them. So you can go back versions just as easily as you can upgrade versions. And you can also change which, like, so you can 
install new versions from the list of full available versions, including changing to a custom remote. So if you've decided to do some development on your own while you're testing things out, you um, publish your own image, you can change to that remote and just install your own version of BlueOS instead of having to use only the official ones. Um, and once you install, it will bootstrap basically kicks in, switches you to the new core image, and then you're, you're now on your new version. Um, so you don't have to restart your vehicle to do that. Well, the autopilot restarts, but the, the vehicle itself doesn't. Um, and that's the uh, pirate mode interface there, changing the changing the remote the, to Williams one. They give out of sync. Oh, okay. Um, all right, video streams. Uh, we have a Mavlink camera manager um, that supports streaming from multiple cameras via USB uh, that get exposed as individual Mavlink components. So that's quite useful for sort of tying them into uh, control station software like QGC that just goes, oh, look, there are Mavlink cameras available, and then it can switch between them pretty easily without having to know about them in advance or be ma like manually told where they are. Um, we currently have UDP, uh, H.264 encoded support, RTSP support, and WebRTC support. Um, and we're also able to advertise external RTSP streams via Mavlink. So if you have an IP camera that presents itself with RTSP, we can sort of hook that into our Mavlink camera manager and present it via Mavlink to a receiving system. Um, we also expose the video for Linux um, camera controls. So if your camera is a USB camera that's providing those controls, then that gets pre presented via Mavlink, which means QGround control, for example, can control your um, camera brightness, and you can also control that from the browser um, in the uh, camera manager. We have plans for on BIF discovery um, and also plans for supporting onboard rec recording onto the uh, SD card on the or the hard drive of, uh, or whatnot on the onboard computer. Um, but those are yet to be implemented. There are a variety of other services. Uh, we William spoke about them in the previous one, so we won't spend too long on them. Um, but there's a bridges service that allows you to um, convert serial devices into UDP ports, uh, similar to SOCAT. Um, that's used under the hood to uh, power our sonars, um, but can also be used for just arbitrary things that you want to like get a serial device, send it to the top as some kind of network thing instead. Uh, the in-browser terminal has a TMUX session by default. Uh, it allows you to escape the Docker container, so you can go from the core Docker container down onto the underlying system and change things if you need to. Um, so there's quite a lot of developer power and freedom there, and we're building developer tools into that to make it nice to use um, and develop like on the system itself. Uh, the NMEA injector takes NMEA strings uh, via UDP and then sends GPS input messages to the autopilot through Mavlink. Um, so if you have a um, NMEA GPS that's USB based, for example, um, you could use like navigators. Uh... Yeah. Right. All right. So picking back up. All good. All right. Okay, uh, picking back up. So yeah, the uh, active process manager uh, for monitoring is quite useful for seeing if some service or um, program is using more resources than you expected. Um, for extensions, we limit those like on a per ca container basis. But if you've got something in core that goes wrong, um, then you might end up with resource usage that's unexpected. So that's quite helpful for debugging. Um, there's also a networking page that gives you information about your IPs, and it also tracks some of your bandwidth usage. So it tells you how many packets you're receiving and sending to each IP, which is useful if you want to know if a network device is actually connected and working. Um, there's dmessage uh, output for kernel um, and device information. So that registers when new devices plug in and get disconnected. So kind of handy if you want to know why is this not showing up? Oh, it never even showed up in the kernel. That's neat. Um, there's also information about the computer firmware. So the um, Raspberry Pi OS version and the um, Blue OS bootloader version that's running. Uh, and then the 
uh, down below that, there's information about the um, Linux kernel that you're um, that you're running and the system time. Um, and then all of the information in the system information uh, is made accessible to other services if they need that. Uh, and that's via our Rust-based Linux to REST API. Uh, so if you have, if you're writing an extension, it needs to know about something to do with the system for, you know, convenience or because it's critical to what it's trying to do, then it can access that via our API, which is a bit nicer than having to make all of the system calls itself. Okay, so let's get back to talking about extensions. As I mentioned before, it, extensions are planned to be a big part of our ecosystem since we have many different integrators and distributors who want a specific functionality that we don't necessarily need in core. Uh, this is what it looks like right now. We have a we have a small store with some examples, and I think one or two companies already chimed in. And it's, it's like early alpha, so it's subject to change and it's not quite finished. The UI needs some revamp, but that's uh, the basic idea. You can you can see his R series and basic data. Uh, the settings are actually Docker settings. Is where you can actually limit what your extension is able to access and do. Okay. We will eventually uh, allow searching with tags and tagging extensions and etc. Uh, there's ex the extension structure is pretty basic. Uh, you need a couple of small things. This is the like is a basic example for, to toggle a GPIO on the Pi. So you need some static HTML files if you if you're going to have a web UI, which in this case it does. It's just a Togo, but still web. Uh, we have register service, which is an endpoint that makes it just pop up on the side menu. Install.sh, in this case, installs some other requirements, which is, in this case, PyGPIO to actually control in the GPIO. And the readme file is actually displayed in the store. When you select each individual version, you can see the readme for that version of that extension. <coughs> And the Docker file, which contains metadata and the recipe for building the image. This is an example uh, extension that people use. It's it's a driver for water linkage DVL, which is a Doppler velocity logger. It tracks. It's like optical flow, but underwater with with sonars. <laughs> and. Since this is now uncoupled for BlueS, it's easy to maintain it, maintain it independently of us. Yeah, so that one was originally built into our right. previous uh, companion software, um, but understandably, it's a DVL from one particular manufacturer. Not everyone uses a DVL, not everyone uses that manufacturer, so it's nice to not have that installed as a requirement, but if you actually need to use it, you can just install the extension for it. Okay, so this is a, another extension we are working on. Oh, okay. I thought it was going to pop up later. It is a GCS we're working on. It's uh, web-based, and it's designed to be modular. It uses WebRTC for video, and it's not uh, released yet, but there are some builds available for testing. There's a good one. There you go, there was. But, but, but. I lost my mouse. <laughs> oh, it's it, okay. Should I skip part of it? So yeah, each of these individual components, like the the depth marker, and the virtual horizon on the top bar, the compass indicator, they are all individual widgets. Uh, our goal is to have a very modular ground station that people can customize as they want. We can have multiple videos. Right. Yeah, next. Can we go to next, yeah. Did I jump on? Yeah, this is an example of how it's managed. You can select and edit each of the individual components. You can add new ones. You can have individual profiles for each of them. I think he has a video as well, right? Yeah. So here we are adding a new 
video. It's a, it's a fake video screen, but oh yeah, there's a cat. <laughs> Mandatory cat text. <laughs> You guys can move on. Mouse. And OK, move on. Let me click on the slides. Yeah. And since our controllers are mostly based on joysticks instead of radio transmitters because water and radio don't mix well, we had to come, with a, come up with a solution for actually mapping things better. We had uh, many issues before with QGC and the uh, SDL mappings going wrong. So yeah, in this case, this is setting up a new controller, um, just clicking on a button, pressing the corresponding button on the controller and just mapping that to the correct place so that it doesn't need to deal with like manually lining up the numbers. You just go, that's the one I want to press, press it, and it knows yep. which one you're doing. So there are actually two different mappings. There's one mapping from joystick to default inputs and then default inputs to functions. And we we will supply most of these default ones for you know, joysticks, such as Xbox, PS4, etc. But if someone is working on a custom joystick, as it's normal in their OV world for reasons, they want things to look rugged, so they make it their own. So it's it makes very easy to map things. And yeah. okay, this is an, a, an example of a cool extension. It's just in a wrapper for Virpro here. I'm not sure if anyone knows it, but it's an app that allows you to share a USB device over IP. Uh, if you look at the Docker file, it's just a lot of labels for metadata that we consume, and it downloads Virpro here and starts it on yeah. time for. No, what? I want to talk about yeah. it more. <laughs> so what it does is that you can easily just plug, for example, a, an ultrasonic sensor that's USB, like a, a rangefinder that was not designed for an ROV at all. You can plug it there, and then you can just open it on your computer as if it was plugged there. It's it's pretty magical, and people should try it. <laughs> This is another cool extension that works very well with uh, virtual here, zero tier. It's like a VPN. So you can just install this extension and then you can control your ROV from anywhere if it has internet. We had um, one of the guys at the office in LA piloting my ROV in Brazil using cockpit. And it was pretty cool. <laughs> and OK. Do you take over? Okay, and we have this covers uh, most of the features we have right now, and we have some other planned features. Uh, we want to do onboard video and audio recording. We don't have that yet. <coughs> uh, as I mentioned before, we want to do multi-source logging synchronization because we have to synchronize multiple videos to the log to all the Mavlink or like data flash log data. Uh, we have we want to improve the debugging tools. We have already GDB in there, so you can actually upload uh, a firmware with debug symbols, and you can connect GDB to it and have like debugging your real hardware instead of zero. Uh, we're planning on support multiple other uh, pies. I mean, single board computers like the Jetson or Banana Pi, Orange Pi, those individual things. This is for Blue S, not necessarily navigator because the pinouts are very important. And we also want to have a like web map link console just to make like map proxy just make things easier to play with. And you can try it. You can download it with this link, just scan the QR code. What? <laughs> uh, the Git the Git it's uh Blue S is open source, it's on GitHub. Uh, we are using, we are currently using Docker Hub for the images, but as you might have seen, we will probably expand for other registries very soon. And I guess that's it. Any questions? I expect many. <laughs> of the OSD editing. That's so just that brilliant. Super cool. That's really, really cool. I wish we could do that with our uh, OSD on, on other systems. Very, very nice to be done. So, any questions about? Uh, uh, ready, go ahead. All right, so um, I saw 
But the firmware update was that certainly you could update the firmware on the autopilot. Can we update the Blue OS version as well? Yeah, yes. that was yes. the go back to both. So this is the Blue OS version. Yeah, this updates yeah. Blue OS. So this changing the Docker, and then yeah, go back. And then within that, we have a firmware flashing tool. That's this one. So you both. Yeah. yeah. Is that right. that's supposed to be a GIF, right? Yeah. yeah. So it fetches the manifest from firmware servers, checks compatibility, and then downloads the firmware. Yes. It's um, it's embedded into it. If it detects a navigator, it uh, fires, just starts autopilot. If it doesn't, if it detects a pixel, then it doesn't. I mean, includes yes. Yeah. So yes. No, it's built in. So that's one of the internal services that's built into part of the core image. Which? I was actually made the selection of sort of simple versions that you, you go with sort of stable, but it actually looks like um actually seeing a demo of that right now is you're selecting firmware versions. Uh <laughs> is it tied in, you know, does it always grab the like civil uh, release or a stable release, or you you select that when you're doing the that's, civil? That's I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, I can't remember what the deal is there. Yeah, I'm uh, sorry, I don't remember exactly how that's done. No worries. We yeah. we actually still have an issue with Cero that we have to uh, we have to get the default parameters uh, sorted out properly. Right. Right so now, we, I'm wondering. So the Cero we do with Mission Planner comes from once built in Cwin on our CI system. Yes. Uh, we don't actually build and distribute civil binaries for other platforms. So as I was wondering how you, you actually go and build it on the navigator or do you pre-build? Yeah. Oh, we do, okay. Okay, then that, that, that's probably uh, where it comes from. Because yeah. <laughs> I don't remember rebuilding it ourselves. That would be weird. So it's probably coming from somewhere. Okay. Yeah. How do you do your identity identification on this? Say, for example, I want to Build a diagnostics application for a log to exist. So the extension like architecture is made to be sort of quite simple. Um, as William was explaining, there's like not that much that's involved in in terms of the files. Like the HTML um, and JSON here are only relevant if you want a web-based interface. Um, the code can be basically anything you can run on a Raspberry Pi, um, and our APIs for internal services are sort of testable via the um, interface that's provided. Uh, and then the Docker file metadata um, requirements so, are documented. Yeah, I guess the answer is it's very easy to run some Python code to analyze logs and show the show the output on a page that's a link on the sidebar. Yeah. I'm not sure if that's the underlying question. Yeah. Okay. It's it's very easy. Yeah. Um. What is? Are you asking? Can we do waypoints in our GCS? Yeah, under the water. Under the water. Um. So if you if you have a positioning system, you can. But our GCS currently has been um like doesn't yet have. Uh, yeah, it, or yeah it's in. it's the next step because of this guy. So we have to start supporting. The positioning. Uh, there are both underwater GPSs, which work as, let's say, rate of sound satellites. So you have like uh, multiple Beacons. transceivers and then a receiver on the vehicle. Yeah, they're like beacons, I guess. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, DVL, as we were yeah. talking the, about. Before. And the DVL is my favorite because it's it, when, it, when it's locked, it's very precise. And it's just beautiful seeing like your ROV just ignoring the water current and <laughs> locked in place. Any more questions? 
suggestions. <laughs> All right, so thank you very much. Thank you.